Welcome to chapter 3. In this chapter we will put everything that we've learned together and try to find a solution for the infinite grid of 1 ohm resistors. Transform a series of values into a generating function. And we even have built a two-dimensional generating function so that we can transfer the discrete values on a grid into a generating function. So this is how the two-dimensional generating function looks like. The point on grid position m and n corresponds with the coefficient of x to the power of m and y to the power of n in the generating function. The diagonal point that we are most interested in would be at x times y. Discrete Laplace transformation that is at the heart of our problem consists of four shift operations, two in plus minus m direction and two in plus minus n direction. Each shift is translated into a multiplication or division by x or y with our characteristic polynomial and at the right hand side we only have a current at the origin which is represented by just a single one. Pulling out f from the equation gives us a simple formula for f of x and y. It's extremely easy to calculate f of x and y. So here we have our solution. That was surprisingly easy. Unfortunately, it's also wrong. Looking closer at this result, we find that it cannot be the solution. Why is this wrong? Well, there are two major problems. First, the generating functions only work well on one half of the number line. Representing infinitely many values in both directions is not as easy. And if we split up the solution in both positive and negative direction, then we need to be extremely careful with the boundary conditions in the middle. This is much simpler in the case of 1D, where there's only one node in the middle, but in the case of two dimensions, we have infinitely many points in the middle. If we split up the solution in four quadrants, each with only positive or only negative values of M and N, then we have the points on the yellow line where we need to fix the boundary conditions. I tried for a while, but failed. It might be better to look for solutions that automatically match the boundary conditions. But let's first go to the continuous case. Why is it much easier to solve the corresponding continuous differential equations? Here is an extremely quick and cursory overview. Here we have the Laplace equation. The Dirac delta indicates a single source of flux at the origin, just like in our example where we have a single source of current at the center point. Due to the symmetry of the problem, the flux of the source would spread out evenly in all directions. This would be the same as in our problem where we found the central current going equally in all four directions. Let's call E the field that is the divergent of the flux. What Gauss's law tells us is that the sum of the field over any surface is the sum of the divergence inside. So this would, in our case, translate to measure the currents in a closed surface. It is the sum of the current sources inside. That should remind you of Kirchhoff's law. In a three-dimensional case, the surface of the red ball at radius r is 4 pi r squared. And since the E field is the same at each point, we can calculate it easily. It's 1 over 4 pi r squared. Since the E field is the divergence of the potential f, we need to integrate this. 
But since everything is symmetrical, this is easy and we get that the potential is proportional to 1 over the absolute value of R. This is in three dimensions. In the two-dimensional case, we only need to divide by the length of the circle instead of the area of the sphere. Thus, we get that E is 1 over 2 pi R. And then again, the integration gives us the potential F as proportional to the logarithm of R. We should expect that this is also the behavior of our discrete 1 ohm resistor case. That far away, the potential should grow with about the logarithm of the distance. By the way, the functions that we have just seen are called Green's functions. They are the solutions that come from a single point source at the origin. Once we have a solution that works for a single point source at the origin, we can easily add up such solutions to get the solutions for more complicated cases, like for example three different point sources, or we could use an integral to account for infinitely many of such point sources. So mathematicians have calculated these Green's functions for many different linear differential equations and also for many different difference equations. And since our discrete Laplace equation is rather important, it has already been solved. So one quick way of finding the solutions for our problem would be to look up the corresponding Green's function and then we are done. But that would be cheating. We want to find it ourselves. Let us look at whether we can find some more symmetry in our problem. If we have our grid of 1 ohm resistors with only one current source in the middle. And draw a rectangle at any place and the sum of all currents leaving the rectangle must be the sum of the ones that come in inside the rectangle. That is our 1 ampere current that we feed in in the middle. Also the currents will be the same on each of the four sides. Unfortunately, they will not be the same along the sides. Here I have drawn four currents leaving the purple square towards the yellow square. This means that the sum of potentials in the yellow square minus the sum of potentials in the blue square is one fourth of the central current. Unfortunately, this also doesn't help us much. So all the searching for symmetry was also a little bit of a dead end. What else can we do? When looking at the generating functions, we found that often the solutions can be expressed in terms of exponential functions, that is, in terms of a geometric series. Let's try this. Let's look at an input function fn that is a constant times a factor of lambda to the power of n. By setting c1 as the logarithm of lambda 1, we can write this as an exponential function with some constant c1. Now, since we are in the two-dimensional case and we have two directions, we bring in two exponential functions, one in m and one in n, with potentially different constants c1 and c2. So what happens when we shift from fm to fm plus 1? If we only shift in the m direction, then the part with n stays the same. Adding 1 in the exponent is just a multiplication and thus we end up with the same function that we have sent into our equation, just scaled up with a factor of e to the power of c2 or a factor of lambda 2. If we do all these shifts in all four directions, as it is expressed in our discrete Laplace operation, we end up 
with the characteristic polynomial again. Everything that is in the parenthesis is a constant that depends on the choice of our initial lambda 1 and lambda 2. As we can use any complex number for our choices of lambda 1 and lambda 2, also use imaginary numbers. Let's set C1 is J beta and C2 is J alpha, where G is the imaginary unit that is the square root of minus 1. We electrical engineers often use J instead of I, as I is often used for the current. So in order not to generate any confusions with the current I, I will also use J here for the complex unit. So we send in complex valued functions with some constant A and two spatial frequencies alpha and beta. In our discrete Laplace operation, we build the sum of fm plus 1 and fm minus 1. Let's look at how this influences our periodic function that we put onto our grid. Just as a reminder, here is Euler's identity. e to the power of j alpha is equal to cosine alpha plus j sine alpha. Adding 1 to m is just a multiplication with e to the j alpha. Subtracting 1 from m results in a multiplication with e to the j minus alpha. With this we find that if we send in such a periodic function, we get the same periodic function but multiplied with a constant factor of 2 times cosine of alpha. Now the same works for n and beta. So if we apply our discrete Laplace operator, we get that if we send in a function fe, that we get out the same function but multiplied by a factor of minus 4 plus 2 cosine alpha plus 2 cosine beta. We call this factor now lambda. Beware that this only works for those exponential functions that we send in. If we send in a function and get it out the same way, except maybe scaled by a factor, we call this function an eigenfunction. So this is what the E stands for. The scaling factor lambda is the corresponding eigenvalue. Also note that we have infinitely many such eigenfunctions and infinitely many eigenvalues that we get by an arbitrary choice of alpha and beta. Of course, we can always add up such eigenfunctions and send them in. Note that by flipping the sign of alpha and beta, we can have four different eigenfunctions that all have the same eigenvalue. This is called a degeneracy. Now normally if we send in different eigenfunctions, the outcome will not be another eigenfunction. But if we add up different eigenfunctions that all have the same eigenvalue lambda, then the combination is also an eigenfunction. By choosing the constant a in front of each of those eigenfunctions, we are rather flexible in combining our four eigenfunctions that belong to the same eigenvalue. Especially, we want to con combine them in a way so that the resulting function is a real function and that all complex parts cancel out. So we get our new eigenfunctions cosine m alpha times cosine m beta. So here we got rid of the imaginary part. We could have done this also in a way that we would have ended up with sine functions instead of cosine. But we want the cosine functions anyways. Because cosine functions are symmetric, 
and the potential in our grid of 1 ohm resistors is certainly symmetric. So from here on we will restrict ourselves to the product of those cosine functions. Now we can also send in functions that are the sum of those eigenfunctions. For example, we choose two arbitrary pairs of alpha 1 and beta 1 and alpha 2 and beta 2 and thus we get eigenfunctions Fe1 and Fe2. We sum them up and scale them by an arbitrary factor K1 and K2. We know that each function will be scaled by its eigenvalue lambda 1 and lambda 2 that we can calculate from knowing the corresponding alpha 1 and alpha 2 and beta 1, beta 2. So what we get out are the same functions Fe1 and Fe2 but now with different scaling factors lambda 1 times k1 and lambda 2 times k2. Please note that the resulting function itself is not an eigenfunction as there is no factor lambda that would allow a simple scaling of the input to the output. Of course, there is nothing that stops us from doing the same thing with three or even more eigenfunctions. Actually, we could sum up infinitely many. Because we sum up infinitely many of our cosine m alpha times cosine n beta functions, we replace the sum with an integral. In order to be able to use any alpha and any beta we want, we let alpha and beta run from minus pi to plus pi each. We could have also used 0 to 2 pi instead. Since cosine is periodic anyways, it doesn't give us any advantage to let alpha and beta take values outside of this range. The function k of alpha and beta represents the arbitrary scaling factor that we can choose for each of the eigenfunctions. Of course, for each of the choice of a function k of alpha and beta, we will get a different potential on our grid capital K M N. Since with the integration we are multiplying our function k with d alpha and d beta, we will in the end divide the integral by the total area of the square. This is just a cosmetic issue. We could have included the factor in the choice of our function small k as well. Now if you look at this formula, you will notice that this formula is the same as the Fourier series. This is the same as if we would take a periodic function small k of alpha and beta and would perform a 2D Fourier transform on it. And then the capital KMN are the respective frequencies that appear in our periodic function. That is nice. And some of you may have already guessed where this is going. We do not want to represent an arbitrary function, but we want to represent our solution as a sum of these eigenfunctions. From the theory of Fourier series, we know that we can represent all well-behaved periodic functions as a Fourier series. Also the opposite is true. All well-behaved series of frequencies, that would be the capital KMN here, have a representation as a function small k. The limits on what well behaved means that guarantee the existence of these functions are a bit strict 
and in our case we are certainly beyond that limit. For one, even thought our potentials are expected to grow slowly with the logarithm of the distance, they will still grow to infinity. Which means we will have larger and larger frequencies with infinitely large coefficients in our series. Certainly not well behaved. We are clearly outside of the bounds of mathematical rigor here. But since with all the failed attempts to solve the problem we are already a bit desperate, let's try it anyway. For now small k is just a function of weights for our eigenfunctions and we assume it to be well behaved. So this is again our discrete Laplace equation. Each distribution of potentials on our grid has an associated distribution of currents that we would have to send in to the grid to get that distribution. You could imagine having infinitely many current sources, one at each grid point, and tuning them to the certain current, or tuning them so to get the desired input potential. In the end we only want to send in one current at the center, so we have imn to be 1 only for m and n equal 0. But we could have imagined sending in currents at all nodes of the grid and then observing the potentials they produce. We already know that if we send in the eigenfunctions, then the potentials will all be eigenfunctions and only scaled by a factor of 1 over lambda. Translated into the realm of the Fourier transformed functions, the Laplace operation becomes a simple multiplication of k of alpha and beta with re result translated into the real of the Fourier transformed functions the Laplace operation becomes a simple multiplication with the eigenvalues. The function k of alpha and beta will result in an i of alpha and beta that represents the Fourier series of the injected currents. From this we can calculate the k of alpha and beta that we need to send in to get a certain distribution of currents. The solution becomes a simple division. Let's just one more time reflect on what we were doing here. Our Laplace operation operates on the capital K. The capital K can be expressed as an integral over all alpha and beta on the eigenfunctions scaled by the function small k. If we swap the integration and the application of our Laplace operation so that each Laplace operation only operates on the eigenfunctions, then we know that each of these operations results in getting the same eigenfunction scaled by a factor of lambda. So this is what we did in the previous step. When we went from the original operation to the multiplication, we just switched the Laplace operation with the integration. On the right hand side of our equation we have the distribution of currents we sent in. What we want to send in is just a current at the origin. That is a 1 at the origin and a 0 everywhere else. In terms of Fourier series this means we have a constant function of 1. This function has no frequencies in it except for a DC component of frequency 0. So this is exactly the result that we should get. Equipped with this we are ready for another attempt to solve our problem. 
k of alpha and beta is 1 over minus 4 plus 2 times cosine alpha plus 2 times cosine beta. Now all that is left is the need to transfer this back into the frequency space so that we get the potentials on the grid nodes. If we draw out a factor of 2, we get the function kmn. There's only one problem with this function. Its potential at the origin is now infinitely large. There is a way to fix this. Since we can choose our ground at any point, we can add any constant value to all the potentials on the grid and still get a valid solution. If we have a value of zero or if we have a value of 1000 volts at the origin, it doesn't matter at all. The only interesting thing are the differences between the nodes. If we set alpha and beta to zero, then the denominator on the fraction goes to zero. So our function has a pole here. It turns out that fixing the potential is easy. If we add the minus one in the numerator, then this adds a constant value to all potentials on the grid. Since the value of minus one does not depend on either m or n. With this fix, we get a much nicer potential of zero at the origin. You can also think of this fix as replacing capital K by capital K minus capital K at zero, zero. And capital K at zero, zero is what we get if we plug in m and n equal zero. For m and n equal zero, we get one in the product of the cosines. And this is it, ladies and gentlemen, this is our Green's function. That represents the potential in our infinite grid of one ohm resistors. From here, it is easy to find the resistance between two points on the grid. We just need to do the same trick that we already used in chapter one. If the Green's function represent the electric potential that is generated by the current of one ampere, then we can imagine that we add one additional current at the point mn where we want to measure the resistance, but just in the other direction. This will cause an equal potential at the origin. Thus, the difference in potential is twice as large. And therefore, the resistance needs to be twice as large. All that is left is multiply our Green's functions by and we have a formula for the resistance between any two points. Rmn represents the resistance between the origin and the point Mn. By plugging in a certain value of m and n, we can numerically evaluate this integral. Let's do this in Python NumPy. This is a function that evaluates the function g on 2000 times 2000 points, that is 4 million points on a grid, and then uses the NumPy trapc function to get an approximation of the integral assuming trapezoid lines between the grid points. The function accepts m and n as input parameters. And if we evaluate this at 1, 1, we get a value that only differs from the true value of 2 over pi at the 13th digit. So this is a good indication that our function is the right one. Of course, this is not a proof. This is what we will do in the next chapter. 
we will try to simplify the integral in an analytic way. Until now, we just have a numerical evaluation. So, stay tuned.